let's uh, start uh, our uh, next dis discussion. Uh, another aspect uh, of uh, Asian Buddhism. As you know, uh, Asian Buddhism has a long history, uh, more than 2,500 years. So Buddhism has influenced the society, uh, on the society uh, immensely. But uh, what I what I'm going to uh, talk uh, in this uh, uh, lecture, some selected aspects, some selected uh, aspects, uh, how they have influenced it. As usual, as I all, always uh, tell uh, you guys, uh, it's going to be a summary of uh, the influence of uh, Buddhism. So uh, let's take a look at, uh, the, uh, I'll be talking uh, these kinds of uh, concepts, concept, uh, concepts or theories or whatever we call in Buddhism, some selected uh, things, some fundamentals. I have put uh, here fundamentals. These are the sum of uh, Buddhist uh, concepts or fundamentals that uh, mm, have influenced the society in terms of uh, Asian uh, people. You know, if you can uh, find a book like uh, Hajime Nakamura, a Japanese scholar, uh, uh, how Asian people things and uh, their culture. It's a good work, uh, scholarly work. You can, if you are interested uh, to uh, read on more, so you can read it. Hajime Nakamura's uh, book uh, in terms of Asian culture, how Buddhism, how Buddhism influence the Asian uh, people. Uh, Asian countries. That is what he uh, has uh, investigated. So, <coughs> uh, some of them are, uh, you, you can uh, uh, see here on my second, on my first uh, slides. Then uh, we have we have talked to some extent uh, on charity, or what's called in Pali dana, yesterday. But it's about theory, it's about theory or the concepts. But in this lecture, uh, what we are, uh, what we are uh, going to, we are going to take a look at uh, we are we are we will be uh, discussing how these theories or concepts influence impacted on asian peoples so dana uh, one of them is charity what we call the practice of giving uh, dana the practice of giving generosity uh, giving or uh, we find a lot of uh, English words. Uh, uh, Bhikkhu Bodhi used the word, uh, the practice of giving. That is what I found in his uh, book, uh, the, uh, a, go uh, a good English uh, translation or word. The practice of giving, uh, and then self sacrifice. Self uh, sacrifice. We have uh, we have discussed to some extent uh, yesterday uh, in terms of theories like uh, the bodhisattva ideal, the bodhisattva ideal, 
how bodhisattva sacrifices uh, the these uh, kind of things then loving kindness you know uh, uh, i believe that you know uh, well on because uh, it's about uh, meditation uh, techniques or one of uh, buddhist meditation practices equality uh, nonviolence uh, truthfulness control over passion no it has something to do with uh, uh, the final goal of buddhism uh, you know as we discussed yesterday uh, there are different levels uh, on the path to nibbana so person can gradually uh, reduce control his uh, passion uh, greedy or craving and at the end or finally eventually he can eliminate the greedy that's called the achievement of nibbana the final goal so it's a process uh, one can uh, practice uh, gradually so uh, purity to purity to purity purity and control over a passion both uh, has to do with uh, uh, worldly and uh, or mundane and supra mundane uh, aspirations mundane and supra mundane aspiration both so uh, this is how asian people you know uh, uh, in their day to day lives when you uh, go to countries uh, if you if you can go to uh, countries uh, uh, like thailand uh, burma or sri lanka in the morning time in the morning time this is a famous uh, scene or on uh, on the roads along the roads a long lines of uh, monks they are begin and people are offerings that's called charity basically uh, as we discussed uh, yesterday people are curious to practice uh, these kinds of uh, uh, practices or uh, uh, concepts so uh, here what you see it's different uh, in the previous two pictures what you uh, saw lay people lay devotees they offered arms to the sangha here uh, a monk donate something to a, a person i don't know what it is it's look like it's look like yeah uh, because uh, it's uh, uh, this picture uh, it's about buddhist story uh, when the buddha was alive when we read the the bi biography of buddha we find this story how uh, not only human beings but uh, animals they uh, practice generosity it's about survival of uh, everyone's the whole world it's not just about human being it's about buddhism always talk that is what we have to remember uh, buddhism is not consider only human beings or only human beings survival 
Buddhism always talk about everyone's, every being, sabhe satta, sabhe satta pali bhaji. So that is why uh, Buddha always uh, talk about uh, the preservation of protection of uh, the environment and live in harmony, uh, you know, with the animals. So uh, I'm going to say this story in brief. I'm going to say uh, this story brief. So what happened uh, at the time of the Buddha, <clears throat> when he was alive, one time there was a, uh, there was a, a conflict, uh, argument between two groups of monks, two groups of monks. So Buddha wanted to slow this problem, their uh, conflict, their argument, they, they were arguing, they were debating based on some uh, Vinaya uh, facts. But what happened, they were not ready to listen uh, to the Buddha. That is how people. So then uh, Buddha tried to resolve Buddha, uh, this conflict, but the monks did not listen to the Buddha. Then what, what Buddha did, he gave uh, up them, he abandoned them, and Buddha went to uh, the forest. He lived for three months, he lived for three months, he spent three months in the forest, especially uh, what's called uh, for rainy retreats, rainy retreats for three months. That is what Buddhist monks and nuns observe uh, once a year. It's uh, annual rites in Buddhist calendar. So then, uh, now uh, Buddha was living in the forest, then how he get foods, arms for his survivors? So at that time, animals, according to these stories, animals offered or provided arms to the Buddha. This is how uh, it happened. This is just uh, imagination, one painter, has draw this uh, incident. So uh, a monkey offer a uh, honeycomb and even elep uh, tusker here and elephants, they uh, provide fruits and these kind of things. Anyway, Buddha, Buddha survived for three months in the forest. Animals help the Buddha in providing arms, roads, and other things. This is how the concept of generosity works uh, in Buddhism uh, and Buddhist society. So next uh, uh, thing, what I'm going to talk about a bit, uh, metta, the concept of uh, Metta, loving kindness. That's uh, one of the important Buddhist uh, meditation technique and concept. Concept that the Buddha also uh, practice. And so, in terms of this uh, uh, concept, here you see. In the uh, one of the famous discourses of the Buddha, it's called Metta Sutta, Metta Sutta in Pali. Here, Buddha say uh, you can read it uh, carefully. You can read it carefully. How one can practice loving kindness? How one can practice loving kindness and radiate these thoughts? There is a simile, there is a simile. The bondage between mother and only child. 
that is how people have to care about others not only human beings but every one sabbe satta sabbe satta everyone in this universe so with next slides uh, uh, i am uh, i i want you guys to get the attention uh, to these slides my next slides in terms of uh, the concept of uh, myth so let's have a short uh, uh, discussion on this i i i want to know you guys uh, what uh, do you guys think and what do you guys uh, experience uh, you if you are comfortable you can share this is about uh, loving kindness uh, it's a saying of uh, the lai lama based on buddhist text it's about uh, happiness and the relationship between loving kindness and happiness so think a mom uh, uh, take a uh, few minutes and try to uh, think something and i i am glad uh, i would like if you can uh, tell something on this it, it, it's going to be a short uh, small classroom activity take 5 minutes or so a few minutes i'm happy if you can share your own experience and whatever the, if you are comfortable you can uh, share uh, your own experience what is uh, he saying when a person get angry how how does it feel your feeling and when you practice loving kindness so when when you are not uh, getting angry how does you uh, how uh, do you feel how do you feel so uh, it's going to be a, a small activity in the class because i never did it i never did it uh, in this class so uh, take a few minutes and after 5 uh, minutes i'm happy to hear from you uh, based on this slide based on this based on this uh, saying how do you see it maybe you have experience please uh, uh, share in 5 minutes you are i, I am welcome everyone's uh opinions if you can share let's uh, think a moment uh, let's take a, a few minutes okay i'm going to uh, maybe you you guys can have a discussion a short discussion too uh i'm going to turn off my uh, microphone and then in 5 minutes i'll be right back
I am back. Uh, I think uh, so. I am happy uh, if you uh, can have any uh, thoughts, any thoughts, uh, ideas, uh, your feelings, and whatever uh, you uh, have. It's about uh, getting angry or its consequences. And please, if you have. All right, so I, <clears throat> with, uh, primarily my wife and I, um, and I'll just say close relationships in, in general with friends and things like that. Um, mm -hmm. If I see that they're going through a, a difficult time, I'll, I'll ask them what's wrong. Uh, and normally I'll invest a lot of personal effort into that as well. And uh, mm -hmm. I'll go on the defensive if, um, their happiness is subpar, if you will, uh, and generally just get angry, especially towards my wife. You know, I take her her personal well being personally. Yeah, it, mm -hmm. you know, like it, it's a reflection on myself, if you will. Um, mm -hmm. And um, yeah, it it doesn't help the situation when she's unhappy, and then I take it personally and get angry mm -hmm. at her unhappiness. Uh, it compounds and generally just makes the, the whole situation 10 times worse. Um, yeah, something I've done recently is now if I, I see that she's experiencing a hard time or going through uh, difficulties, whether it's like just stressful at work or just having a bad day, um, mm -hmm. I, I try to separate myself uh, a little bit and go into the situation a little disconnected if you will, mm -hmm. um, yeah, try to be more compassionate. So uh, the thing that I'm starting now is uh, I'll ask her what's wrong. And no matter the response, whether it's, mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, you yeah, know, her bad time is in regards to something I've done, or she's just having a bad day, I'll start off the conversation with, you know, what's wrong, she'll answer. And then I'll just say, okay, I'm just asking. Mm -hmm. And then I give it a minute to process, uh, you know, and uh, I'll approach it with more of a, a compassionate approach, uh, a, you know, a, an egoless approach, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it's been a lot more beneficial. Uh, it's a lot more helpful. But, you know, like I said, when you go into it with with anger or an ego and associate somebody's um, stress or somebody's suffering yeah, yeah. with, uh, you know, an identification towards myself or just the self in general, it, it, it just compounds. It adds to yeah, it's, the it's, issue. Yeah. So it's going to increase step by step. You know? then yeah. You will have a lot of consequences. Yeah. yeah. Go, I, I, yeah. Sorry. I bothered. Oh, no, you're fine. Uh, I mean, that's, that's generally it. Um, you know, the, if you just take a moment to, um, to go into it disconnected from the self, um, you know, and go into it with more of a compassion in regardless of whether or not it's my fault. Yeah. You know, it, it shouldn't matter. You know, if I, if I did something, uh, in attaching an ego to that something I did, it's not going to be beneficial in any way. Uh, you know, it, it, acknowledging um, that somebody's suffering is the key point. And then showing compassion and meta towards that is the, the ideal situation, mm -hmm. the, the beneficial yeah. route. Yeah. Great. Great. So uh, it's uh... Uh, I am. Uh, it was great that you shared. Actually, uh, what I want to hear, it's not about uh, personal, but uh, in general, in general, you know, uh, as uh, you know, we have experienced too. But in general, what you know about this, what you have heard about this, 
that is what uh, I am curious to know about this concept. Maybe you can uh, talk about uh, based on your personal experience too, as uh, Corey did. You know, that is what. Uh, uh, yeah, it's up to you. Uh, yeah. Any yes, other loving, loving kindness and compassion mm -hmm. are two of the Brahma Viharas. Yeah. For sublime conducts. Yeah. Um, in the United States, there is this mm -hmm. common um, saying that um, people, young people may be wild, but when they marry and have children, they will, you know, mm -hmm. settle down and they will yeah. become calmer. And of course, mm -hmm. that does not always happen. But um, when it does, I think it is just because you have these people around you whom you love mm -hmm. and care for and want to take care of. And this mm -hmm. decreases the self-centeredness and self-obsession that you had before mm -hmm. you became involved with them. So mm -hmm. um, this is definitely true that the love can help develop the inner happiness and peace mm -hmm. in, in this way. It's just because yeah. you become connected with someone you love, you are with them very frequently mm -hmm. every day you see them. And this helps the mind to, to calm down and be more at peace because you're not yeah. uh, at struggle with someone constantly. Yeah, yeah. actually in that case, we have to find uh, the, uh, what's called sustainable solution for this problem. Otherwise, you know, every uh, human beings are, are going to be in big trouble. Eh? So it's about our mind, you know, everything is uh, planned in our mind, you know. Mind is the foreigner, uh, according to Buddhism, mind is the foreigner of, so, yeah, uh, that is what I can say in terms of your opinions, ideas. That's good. One thing that I think is, uh, yeah. uh, one thing I think is pertinent is uh, the Buddha said we can't appease anger by anger. So uh, definitely loving kindness and just generally friendliness uh, will do much more, I think, as the Buddha said, to develop happiness and peace. Uh, I would also say it's, it's interesting. Uh, I had always struggled a little bit with meta meditation, and I was watching a, a talk by Bhante Gunaratana, and yeah. he was saying that loving kindness could be defined better as friendliness that a lot of people try to think of it as this perfect love, this perfect, you know, absolute love. And that's, a, I think, a difficult thing. It's a pretty high bar if you're just going to sit there and focus on that. Yeah. Whereas I think, In theory, you know, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's hard to just do <laughs> yeah. that. Uh, friendliness, though, is something you can uh, cultivate and, and feel in meditation. So at least I found that to be more helpful. Yeah, in the, yeah, uh, great, great. You know, in a simple manner, how we can uh, develop uh, and uh, recognize this concept. It's about uh, friendship, friendship, developing friendship towards uh, from uh, the person to the whole uh, environment, according to Buddhism, not only the parents, uh, the society, not only human beings, but as I already told, uh, everyone maybe deities, maybe uh, non-human uh, beings uh, who live in this uh, you know, universe, animals, whoever. It's about friendship, as you said, you know, that, that's, this, uh, that's the simple way to uh, explain and understand this concept. Yeah. Great. Yeah, when you, um, you know, look at this Elite. slogan, if you will, <laughs> um, <laughs> and you, you know, you think of what it's, what it's saying, you know, like feeling this loving kindness toward others and helping to develop inner peace. Like, of course, you know, and this is the meta meditation we do, but yeah, if you love someone, 
it's easy if it's someone who's neutral yeah. you know okay and then like you just said jeff i like that thinking of friendliness it's, it's pretty easy to be friendly to someone who's neutral what do you think of it being someone who's upset you you now see that it's impossible to practice loving kindness without having some sort of practice or practicing some sort of selflessness because if you're going to find a way to be friendly or caring or kind or loving towards someone who's done you harm, you're it's not that easy. Huh? It's not yeah. that easy. Yeah. And it's forcing you at that level to develop inner peace, because mm-hmm. if you're going to do it earnestly, there's, there's some sort of inner development that's taking place. That's either you realizing, you know, there is a phrase that Dalai Lama said once, like others are many and you are one, like it's that simple. Like, you know, there are all these other people and just you like, just be selfless, you know, and um, there are so many of them that need help versus you. So it's like when you start not being the center of your world, all of your problems also diminish because then everything's not about me being happy, me getting the food I want, me getting this item I want. And it becomes more about pleasing others and being a blessing to others and not a defilement. And then this uh, saying as well also makes me think of that story. I'm sure we've all heard it about near the Buddha uh, likening anger to being a hot coal with the intention of throwing it at someone else. And you're the one getting burned because when you are angry, it is like you, you're drinking a poison. I mean, you feel it. It's, it's burning you up. You become habitual about it, neurotic. You're upset. It does nothing but hurt you and do nothing to help the other person at all. So it's a lot easier to try to be a blessing to others and not be, you know, a hindrance. And one of the easiest ways to do that is to, well, easy, but try to practice loving kindness and compassion. And also when we do that, I know um, that when negative comma arises or takes effect in your life, it's going to be lessened to a great extent if you have a mind that's full of like altruism and love and compassion. And if it's full of like hate and enmity and anger, it's going to be intensified any negative comma that you have happening so it's in our best interest to do this for developing inner peace yeah great great Mm, i feel that in order to really have the true happiness Mm -hmm. will be that um we could at least first practice uh, non-attachment because Mm -hmm. without that when we perform this uh, loving kindness you're gonna end up wanting people to follow your advice uh, follow the way that you think it's right Mm -hmm. so the uh, not to be clinging and to stay equanimous will be the key to stay uh, happy Oh, 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 attachment. That's the big thing, huh? Yeah, yeah. because you're going to end up <laughs> asking people to follow you. Yeah. You think this mm-hmm. is the only way to feel happy, to, to be the better way. But actually, mm-hmm. most of the time, it's not. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, so great. But I'd also I have feel, ha- because, you know, in English, in Christianity, they do mm-hmm. practice loving kindness. Then how do we mm. differentiate what Buddhism taught from their teachings? Uh, yeah. Uh, I have no idea about uh, Christianity, uh, uh, Lisa. So oh. <laughs> yeah, I have to find out. <laughs> I, know, uh, I know a bit about uh, Christianity, but I, I have no idea about the uh, the concept of love and kindness in Christianity. Yeah. So I have to find out it. Yeah. Sorry. No problem. Uh, yeah. So uh, uh, let's go on with uh, if you if you don't have any other uh, opinions i'm going to go on with our discussion continue with our discussion so uh, think th- this is about uh, uh, what i i got uh, some from the uh, internet uh, this is about uh, loving kindness too how uh, should people uh, practice it it's uh, how uh, 
uh, in the context of Buddhism, it's a valuable uh, practice. It's a valuable practice. Uh, according to modern uh, science, uh, science uh, and uh, you know, uh, in terms of uh, uh, what's called uh, health, in terms of uh, personal health too, you know, what we know, it has a lot of benefits. When we get anger, it's harmful for us. It's harmful for us first. So I also experience the same thing because I am an ordinary person, even though I am a Buddhist monk, I, I am trying to uh, practice. Uh, so, according to my personal experience, too, it's not that easy, but we are trying to, we are on the path to uh, Nibbana. Okay, uh, that's one concept. Uh, uh, the uh, rest of the Buddhist history, even uh, at the time of the Buddha, Buddha. Uh, uh, show his loving kindness towards uh, the whole uh, universe. We have a lot of stories how he uh, practice uh, these, uh, the concept of loving kindness, uh, metta, uh, with the human beings and animals, deities, with everyone. So next uh, thing is uh, bodhisattva ideal. Bodhisattva ideal, we talk, uh, yesterday the concept theory today what we are going to uh, talk how it affected and shaped the lives of buddhist in asia uh, in terms of society this is the most uh, influential concept that is what i feel and that is what i uh, see uh, uh, in most cases in South uh, East Asian and uh, Northern uh, uh, East Asian Buddhist countries like uh, China, Japan, uh, Korea, Vietnam, in those countries and uh, Northern Buddhism, like Tibetan Buddhism. Uh, because the Bodhisattva ideal uh, is uh, practiced in uh, Mahayana and Vajrayana Buddhism when compared with Theravada. Actually, in Theravada tradition, too, Bodhisattva has uh, people follow Bodhisattva ideal and Bodhisattva's ethics, but when compared with uh, Mahayana, uh, they practice more because everyone is a bodhisattva that is what the, the everyone is following uh, the bodhisattva idea so that is why it uh, influenced and uh, it shaped the uh, people's uh, thoughts and people's behavior people's mind bodhisattva uh, idea Basically, uh, as we uh, talk uh, yesterday, uh, compassion and wisdom, compassion and wisdom. These are the two uh, thoughts uh, which uh, uh, practice, which, uh, uh, you know, uh, the Bodhisattva practices these two uh, thoughts, compassion and wisdom. And what we can say, his thought, he, 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 his thought, you know, it's a combination. It's a combination of these two kinds of thought, 
compassion and wisdom. So as I uh, told you, uh, he wants everyone to achieve the final goal, uh, Buddhahood. Then Buddhist in uh, Asian countries uh, follow uh, this ideal. For example, politicians like kings, emperors, they practice the Bodhisattva ideal because uh, kings or rulers or presidents or prime ministers, politicians, they have a lot to do with this concept because they have to take care of the, the people. They should have sympathy, empathy, and altruism and generosity. Everything is in this ideal. Now uh, we are looking uh, at, we are going to discuss examples for this, examples for uh, this. For example, in Japan, in the history of Japan, Prince Sotoku, Sotoku Taishi, He's a, a great emperor in terms of uh, Japanese Buddhism. He, uh, 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 in terms of introduction and development of Japanese Buddhism, he did a great uh, service to Japanese Buddhism. Then, according to text and historical sources, he follow. He's a, he's a, like a bodhisattva. He followed the bodhisattva ideal, even though. Uh, He's a, uh, he was a ruler or king. Then people uh, recognize in Japan uh, or consider Prince Sotoko uh, as a bodhisattva based on his policies, based on how he uh, acted and how he worked during his regime. Sotoko Taishi, I, I can just uh, show his uh, picture, just imagination, imagination. No one had, uh, you know, seen him, you know, recently. This is a, a statue of uh, him, uh, Sotoko Taishi in Japan. Because uh, after his demise, people respect a lot because of his bodhisattva, uh, his policies, what he practiced, how he ruled uh, based on Buddhism, bodhisattva ideal. When we talk about uh, uh, development, uh, uh, we already finished in my uh, last uh, in my first lecture series. So when we talk about uh, introduction and development of Buddhism in each Asian countries, we find uh, uh, ideal figures in terms of uh, kings or emperors who work, uh, who help in many ways in order to establish or develop Buddhism in their countries. Then when we talk about Japan, this is the king or uh, ruler who uh, did a great service in order to establish Buddhism in Japan. When you talk about, when it go to uh, India, as you know, can anyone say? Uh, when it's go to India, because we have talked uh, about him uh, in this in our lecture series, Emperor Ashoka, Emperor Ashoka. So when it's go to Myanmar, uh, Myanmar or Burma, there is uh, there uh, there was a famous king. His name is King Anavrata or Anuruddha. And this is how they uh, work. Uh, then uh, you know about uh, the other uh, 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 
another example, another example, Dalai Lama. So uh, people uh, venerate uh, him as an incarnation of the celestial Bodhisattva, Avalokitesara, he consider, people consider as a Bodhisattva, Dalai Lama in Tibetan Buddhism. Traditionally, in Tibetan Buddhist tradition, uh, there are a lot of stories about his reincarnation or rebirth and a lot, because uh, Tibetan Buddhists are firm uh, believers of the concept of karma and rebirth. So, So uh, this is how Buddhism uh, uh, the Bodhisattva concept influence because uh, as you know Dalai Lama he is the secular leader uh, uh, not at this time actually at this time too but he's out of uh, uh, his country. Anyway. Uh, he is the uh, leader or leader of a uh, secular leader and religious spiritual leader. Both he has uh, two roles in uh, Tibet. Secular as well as religious governments of Tibet, both. The, uh, you know, uh, that. It, it's a unique Buddhist country in terms of uh, uh, Buddhist influence or impact. Uh, when we talk about Buddhist influence in Asian countries, it's a unique country. Why? Uh, because of these two things. That is what I uh, see it. Secular leader and religious leader, both uh, Dalai Lama hold both. Uh, so you know him, so you have seen him. Have you have you ever met him in the USA? Uh, maybe you have you had the chance. So. Uh, with that topic, now uh, we are going to talk about uh, uh, politics uh, and uh, let's talk about uh, politics uh, because based on uh, Buddhist principle, based on Buddhist principles in uh, India, Buddha talk to anyone, uh, Buddha talk to everyone in, uh, in the society, kings, beggars, millionaires, or rich people, poor people, whoever uh, he uh, met and who, uh, the people who needs uh, spiritual help. So he associated a lot of kings at that time, at the time of uh, when he was alive, he talked to them. And then when we uh, examine the Pali Canon early text, uh, and even scholars have uh, uh, in investigated uh, the Pali Canon in terms of Buddhist political norms of philosophy, they have uh, created it based on Buddha's ideas on politics, ruling, uh, you can find it, uh, if you are interested to read it, you can find it in uh, secondary sources in terms of Buddhist social thoughts, Buddhist social philosophy, uh, in books like Buddhist social philosophy, uh, Buddhist social thoughts, Buddhist social norms, you can find a lot more uh, on Buddhist politics, Buddha's views. So 
lot of lot of concepts and theories then uh, later on later on or even at the time of the buddha too kings or emperors rulers try to follow buddhist norms we find a few names uh, when the buddha was alive like uh, uh, king kosala kosala one of uh, kings and bimbisara kosala uh, bimbisara and these kinds of uh, kings they have they had close relationship uh, with the buddha they always met uh, met the uh, buddha whenever they need advice so buddha gave his uh, opinion on uh, politics and ruling so anyway uh, after the uh, buddha's uh, passing away what we see the ideal uh, figure we find uh, in the 3rd century bc emperor ashoka emperor ashoka he tried to practice this is how uh, Paul, uh, Paul, this is how buddhism uh, buddhist concept buddhist theories influence uh, the society in terms of politics he tried to follow buddhist norms emperor ashoka he he is the great uh, example ideal example so actually at the beginning uh, before he was not a buddhist actually he was not a buddhist emperor so that is what uh, maybe you know so he uh, what he did he was uh, invading he was invading uh, neighboring countries or states and he was uh, he wanted to extend his political power to neighboring states in india in order to do that he uh, fought and uh, you know uh, he engaged he, uh, you know uh, he killed people and, you know because of the war uh, people kill injured lot of consequences finally he met a novice monks finally he met a novice monks what is called uh, as i told you uh, a little monk according to traditional uh, according to the traditional story and he uh, embraced buddhism then he tried to uh, follow buddhist political norms political uh, ethics then he he gave up his policies in terms of uh, war and uh, invading countries uh, forcing uh, force of arms uh, by for, force of arms then he uh, as you know as we have discussed he patronized he supported the uh, and uh, he uh, for the first buddhist council uh, the third buddhist council and uh, he because of his great works buddhism became a world religion he sent missionaries to nine uh, countries as we have discussed so uh, emperor ashoka he was the one uh, uh, he was the uh, uh, one of the great examples who follow the buddhist ideals buddhist uh, political norms political uh, norms so uh, Uh, it's about india indian examples then we are we, when we come to uh, uh, countries like sri lanka myanmar japan we find the same examples in terms of politics 
for example, uh, Sri Lanka. You know, I know, I know uh, well uh, on Sri Lanka because it's my uh, country. So, uh, according to Sri Lankan history, Sri Lankan Buddhism has 2,300 years history, 2,300 years history in the third century BC. King Asoka's son and daughter, Emperor Asoka's son and daughter, Venerable Mahinda and Sangha, Bikuni Sangamitta, Bikku Mahinda and Bikuni Sangamitta, they introduced uh, Buddhism uh, to Sri Lanka, the order of monks and order of nuns. So what happened, it's a nice story. It's a unique story like Tibet, uh, Tibetan examples like Dalai Lama. Dalai Lama. Uh, as I told you, he's, he's a secular leader and uh, religious leader. In the case of Sri Lanka, what happened in the third century BC, when missionaries uh, came to Sri Lanka, Sri Lankan king, he welcomed them. Because according to scholars, uh, there was uh, a close relationship between Emperor Asoka and Sri Lankan uh, king before uh, introduction of Buddhism to Sri Lanka. That is why uh, King Devanampiti welcomed these uh, missionaries and embraced uh, Buddhism. He became a Buddhist. Then, he want uh, he uh, when well, Mahinda, he was the leader of uh, missionary group. He uh, taught, he delivered Dhamma sermon. He introduced Buddhism to Sri Lankan people, including kings and royalties. Then uh, King Devanampitis understood the Buddhist norms, for example, like uh, charity, the concept of dana. Uh, it's valid, uh, it's uh, significant. So what he want, he wanted to offer something. He wanted to offer something to the Sangha. What did he offer? He offered a lot of things, material things, but the unique thing is Sri Lanka, uh, he offered the whole country, the whole country, the whole island. It's an island, you know, Sri Lanka, a small country. He offered the whole country to the Sangha. That is how he practiced uh, generosity. Then the Buddhist dispensation, the order of Sangha, they became the owner of that, the owner of the, the country. You know, then always Sangha had power. Even at present, to Sangha has power to uh, control, uh, handle the political situation in country. Political situation in uh, countries uh, like in Sri Lanka. Always uh, kings uh, followed Buddhist monks' advice, Buddhist norms. Uh, this is what uh, happened. So I'm just showing uh, some picture. Uh, you know, uh, it's same in uh, Myanmar and Japanese too. I just put some uh, pictures. This is uh, in Thailand. Uh, how uh, Buddhism and uh, politics are interconnected. Sri Lanka. So, you know, here, uh, Sri Lankan uh, president and prime, prime minister, they are brothers, younger, uh, elder brother and younger brother, prime minister and uh, presidents. So uh, this is how they continue with traditions. Uh, 
so let's take a, a short break and uh, after that uh, continue with our discussion in terms of uh, political influence in asian countries 10 minutes break uh, in the history in the history of uh, sri lankan buddhism uh, how uh, political relation between Buddhism and uh, politics, uh, how uh, this relationship uh, began uh, in the third century BCE, in the third century BCE, and it's continued at present too. No, no more kings in Sri Lanka, now uh, uh, president and prime minister. Uh, right after, uh, you know, People elect a, a president, and uh, then uh, right after uh, electing, right, right, uh, right after showing, they have to visit uh, the Sangha. That's the tradition, that's the Buddhist culture in Sri Lanka. And they have to pay homage uh, to them, and that's the tradition. And even maybe you, uh, uh, maybe you know we, we are going to have a discussion on this uh, in terms of uh, Buddhist rituals in our next uh, lecture uh, lecture series. First of all, they have to worship the uh, temple uh, uh, of uh, two relics. Uh, it symbolizes the Buddha, living Buddha, you know, uh, uh, relics in Buddhism. So at first, they uh, visit the temple of Tooth Relic. They worship Tooth Relic. It means they uh, visit the Buddha, pay homage, and then they meet uh, the Sangha. That is how the uh, uh, political leaders has, uh, has, uh, uh, have to follow this uh, tradition. So uh, this is uh, the uh, the prime minister is getting uh, uh, a blessing from the sangha. So uh, next we go to the uh, another uh, Asian Buddhist country, uh, Myanmar. Myanmar. Uh, they have uh, the same kinds uh, of tradition, but in each Buddhist country, uh, we find unique uh, traditions in terms of uh, the relationship between Buddhism and politics. As I already told you, in India, in Tibet, and we are going to talk more on Tibet, and then uh, when it's go to uh, uh, Burma or Myanmar, uh, it's a Theravada Buddhist country. Uh, the first Prime Minister of Burma, Unu, Unu, Prime Minister Unu, he uh, promulgated a program, uh, as I put uh, here, of reform referred to as a Buddhist socialism, Buddhist socialism, Buddhist socialism. because uh, he uh, did uh, want to follow Buddhist ideals, Buddhist ideals, Buddhist political norms. That is what, because uh, they, uh, in Burma too, they had a great tradition, great history in terms of Buddhism. Like I just told about King Anuruddha, Anuruddha or Anavrata one of Burmese uh, kings, Myanmar. Uh, he follow uh, Buddhist norms, Buddhist uh, political norms, Buddhist political ethics. Then the present leaders, they have examples uh, in the past. That is why Prime Minister Unu tried to uh, practice uh, Buddhist socialism, he wanted to do it. So same examples we can find uh, in uh, Sri Lanka too. Uh, let's go to uh, Tibet again. Uh, I have a, a 
video Corey, can we uh, watch it now right now sure yeah, do you want to send me the link yeah i'll i'll send it It's about uh, Dalai Lama's thoughts on his uh, role. So you sent it at a specific time. Did you want it at that time? Or did you want me to start from uh, the beginning? Yeah, let's uh, watch uh, and I'll let you know the, you know, when, when you want to stop, I think. Yeah. Uh, Do you want me to start from the beginning though? Yeah, 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 yeah. That's okay. That's good. He's one of the best known people on the planet, a spiritual leader. Many problem is our own creation. We forget oneness of humanity. A Nobel Prize winner who's won the support of politicians the world over. But the Dalai Lama has long been a thorn in China's side. Nobody say Dalai Lama of China. Everywhere say Dalai Lama of Tibet. After China sent troops into Tibet, he fled to India. Ever since, he's lived in the shadows of the Himalayas, close to the town of Dharamshala in Himachal Pradesh. As the Dalai Lama approaches his 84th birthday, has he given up all hope of returning home? And is China's influence overshadowing his own? Thank you very much for joining us here on BBC News. Everybody looks to you for guidance and answers. So what's the secret to a long life? You're about to turn 84. I had a peace of mind. Peace of mind. That really makes differences. And also, you see, health. And then I think the realistic uh, attitude is also very important. The things, like you see, this body, some sort of illness, just part of the nature, no use complain. So similarly, in the society, some problems, no use to complain, except that reality, reality, no problem. In the past, the Chinese government haven't been very kind about you. They've called you a demon. Hmm? Um, if they use language like that, is there any hope that a meeting could ever be constructive? Yes, one Chinese official uh, described me as a demon. So then when I first heard that, I, my response is, yes, I'm demon with horn. This is nothing. For me, nothing. Actually, I feel pity, their ignorance, and their political sort of, sort of thinking, very narrow-minded. Have you given up the hope of no. returning? No, no, no. Tibetan people very much sort of trust me. So they are very, very eager. So how would that happen, Your Holiness? No. China is changing. Now, last few years, I have some uh, contact, some Chinese, uh, where even some Officials. So you have had contact in the yes, last few years with the, Chinese officials? Who, entirely, who? Uh, privately. A uh, number of Chinese retired officials and some scholars, you see, who have some connection with the Chinese government. Has President Xi ever asked you for a meeting? Not yet. There have been occasions where world leaders have met you 
and then China's got angry. Um, for example, when David Cameron met you and it led to bad relations between the UK and China. Do you think China's growing influence is having an impact on your own influence and the cause of Tibet? I don't care. No. I think the Chinese seems, uh, themselves is changing their attitude. You once said that you would be interested in meeting President Trump. Has he ever asked you for a meeting? No. 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 Isn't that surprising given that so many US presidents used to jump at the chance to meet you? I know you're friends with George W. Bush, you've met Barack Obama, you've met other presidents. Um, has Donald Trump snubbed you? Uh, frankly speaking, you see, his emotion also a little bit <laughs> see, too complicated. <laughs> what do you mean by that? What do you think of him in office? One day he says something, another day he says something. But I think lack of moral principle. Uh, when he became president, he expressed America first. That is wrong. America see, should take the global responsibility. And then the climate condition, environment issue, very important. He withdraw from Paris Accord. I think that's wrong. America, uh, industrialized nation, uh, should think seriously about uh, protection of environment. And then I think now the Mexican when I saw picture some of these uh, young children, very sad. So America, as a leading nation of a uh, free country, I think should carry some uh, compassion, moral principle. You, and you don't think President Trump seems to be lacking. One thing that is difficult to sort out at the moment, um, Your Holiness, is the situation with Brexit back in the UK. The two sides just cannot come to any agreement. Mm. I don't know detail, but overall, uh, I am one admirer of the spirit of European Union. So you're anti-Brexit then? I feel the after the um, Second World War, is it the keen sort of the uh, state, France and Germany, First World War, arch enemy, Second World War, arch enemy. I feel because the European Union uh, developed, so at least those member states last few decades peaceful. If European Union not developed, then last few decades, I think some uh, fight within the member state. I'm outsider, but I feel better remain in the union. The campaign to leave the European Union used one of your quotes in their posters. It said, the goal should be that migrants return and help rebuild their countries. You have to be practical. It's impossible for everyone to come. And that was used in a poster by the yes, Leave yes. campaign. Mm. What did you make of that? When you see a number of uh, people from Africa go to Europe, mm. at that, that time, you say, I uh, express e Europe for Europeans, the European country should take these refugees and give them education and training and then aiming is return to their own land uh, with certain skill and then European countries also have the moral responsibility to rebuild their own country. European people so better uh, keep Europe for Europeans. But meantime, uh, take these refugees and help maximum way. And the aim is to rebuild their own area, their own country. 
I read that. Some people say in the spirit of immigration, saying something like Europe for Europeans isn't a welcoming statement to make in this current era, where there's so many, 70 million people displaced at the moment in the world. No, refugee problem, really, really sad thing. Many people uh, leave their own country. And most of these poor people now in the Middle East, really very sad. And Yemen and, and Syria, oh, Afghanistan. I think. Uh, Korea, can we skip a uh, little bit oh. at the end of, yeah. It's... Essentially, all, all good. <laughs> the, uh, that people, I think, prefer not see uh, uh, that face. Can you see why a lot of women, though, found that quite offensive when you said it? So one Indian, you see, because uh, of some complaint about my sort of, that sort of my Kasavda expression. But OK, uh, I think they themselves, I think uh, if there's opportunity to ask whether they spend some money for makeup, I think they must do something. A lot of women would say that's objectifying women. And it's about who you are inside, isn't it? Yes, I think both. Real beauty is inner beauty. That's true. But we human beings, I think the appearance is also important. And so do you believe that women now in today's society should be treated equally um, when it comes to opportunities and also pay? Because women get paid a lot less than men, for example, for doing the same job. It should be equal. It should be equal. I think Buddha, as a Buddhist, is a Buddha firstly uh, totally reject caste system. Then also you see Buddha uh, treated equally, male and female. A lot of people say this world today is far less tolerant than it used to be. Yes. What would you say to people who are looking for answers? Many problems is our own creation. You see, we forget oneness of humanity. One world forget. Just small, my country, my religious faith. Too much emphasis that. Good. Thank, Thank you. you very much for your time. Thank you. That's the end. Uh, it's about uh, uh, Tibet and how uh, Buddhists influence there in terms of uh, politics in some pictures and activities of uh, Dalai Lama with world leaders. It's a, he, 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 in Tibet, as I uh, already explained, Tibet people consider he is a, uh, as a Bodhisattva or living Buddha sometimes. Meanwhile, he uh, his role, he has a role in terms of uh, national and international politics. That is what we uh, notice here. with Nelson Mandela. So, uh, 
now we are coming to uh, coming back to india uh, because uh, in india as you heard uh, in uh, in the interview dalai lama uh, uh, told so buddha reject the caste system he always uh, talk about equality equality equal rights you know it, it was a big thing uh, when he was alive the caste system in india even at present too now after 2500 uh, years too the things has not changed that much uh, in india in terms of caste system i am taking one examples so uh ambedkar he is a indian uh, an indian uh, minister who uh, lived in the last uh, century politician what happened uh, because uh, he faced uh, discrimination discrimination in terms of caste because he uh, belonged to low uh, caste so what's called dalit uh, according to my remembrance dalit so he faced a lot of difficulties and discrimination in india though he was a minister and educated people he was a justice minister he wrote a, a indian constitution too but uh, finally he was uh, looking at solutions solutions and opportunity because he was hindu and hindu practitioner because uh, this is about last century buddhism already disappeared uh, in india as we talk in our last lecture series when uh, 11th century something like that ce buddhism already uh, disappeared no more buddhist practitioner in india but at present what we see we uh, see uh, some buddhist in india minority uh, religious minority uh, so ambedkar finally uh, try uh, you know he wanted to change his faith he was uh, looking for a solution then he found though he was a hindu he was hindu buddha ha buddha always uh, talk about equality and he rejected the caste system in the 6th century bc at that time it was very uh, strong and uh, it, uh, it it was a challenge uh, rejecting the caste system we find basically four caste and some other uh, many more caste in india then what they thought it's uh, uh, you cannot ever change this uh, system because it's about uh, gods or maha brahmas creation maha brahma depending his uh, will he is the one who is finally responsible for the caste system that is what hindu people brahmins or at that time vedic people they uh, taught but buddha rejected he uh, gave biological uh, a lot of evidence in terms of biology uh, in terms of uh, history in terms of uh, sociology uh, uh, politics Uh, ethics a lot of uh, facts in order to reject the caste system and to uh, preserve the equality in the society that's a great things in terms of buddhist uh, social thought and social philosophy it influenced in many buddhist countries uh, this uh, buddhist norms uh, that is why uh, buddha uh, gave everyone uh, when he recruit when he recruit and uh, 
when people ordain in the Buddhist uh, dispensation, anyone could ordain, irrespective of uh, any caste system. And then uh, in the Buddhist dispensation too, he practically uh, show the world he is not uh, he is uh, it's not a good thing uh, it's a bad uh, uh, and it has no ba base uh, basis that is what he saw uh, saw in a lot of evidence facts so uh, then ambedkar uh, he found the teachings of the Buddha, he then, uh, he, what he did, he decided to change his faith, religions. Finally, he embraced Buddhism, not, not only him, a uh, lot of people, thousand of, uh, his caste, because they have no options, a lot of discrimination. The Buddhism was the only uh, religion in India. So only solution that now uh, at present, some Buddhists are there, majority uh, uh, belong to this uh, caste or what, uh, because of the Ambedkar's uh, effort. So that is how uh, it's about equality and social justice and uh, politics to how Buddhism influence in Asian countries. You know, it's a recent ex uh, examples. So I, I can just uh, show you his uh, picture, Ambedkar. So as I have put here, according to Sri Lankan constitution, uh, under article nine, uh, there is, uh, I have uh, put here a court, the state, uh, uh, how uh, the Sri Lankan government consider and give uh, priority to uh, Buddhism, because it's about history, it's about tradition, uh, it's not about uh, discrimination or lowering some uh, thing else or some other religions, because uh, that's the tradition. Mm, that is why I just uh, put here a court. Here, Buddha Sasana, Buddha Sasana, the word Sasana, it's meaning uh, dispensation, dispensation, Buddhist order, Buddhist order. So uh, before go to uh, next uh, uh, part, uh, if you have any uh, thing to ask, uh, it's time for, it's time. So if you need to clarify something more, uh, I'm happy to do it. Yes, Bhante, I have a question about yeah. the slide you show that the Sri Lanka mm -hmm. president got to go mm -hmm. visit the uh, Sangha people. Mm -hmm. um, because there are so many Sanghas in Sri Lanka, how did mm -hmm. he decide which one to go to? Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, in Sri Lanka, actually, uh, 
what's called uh, in uh, there is a hierarchy hierarchy so sangha has to uh, leaders monastic leaders of uh, chief uh, sanghas chief sanghas so usually uh, in sri lanka at present uh, maybe you know there are three buddhist sects because of uh, you know colony colonialism sri lanka faced a lot of difficulties uh, in the past for 400 uh, nearly 400 years from uh, 1500 ce to uh, 1948 for a long time so uh, because of uh, this uh, colonialism, uh, Buddhism, uh, Sri Lankan Buddhism suffered, Sri Lanka lost its uh, Buddhist dispensation, almost lost Buddhist dispensation. Uh, then Thailand and Burma, they are the people and they are the country they help in order to reestablish the order of Sangha in Sri Lanka. Then uh, in Sri Lanka at present, we have uh, several sects. Some sects uh, from Burma, uh, came from Burma, introduced from Burma. Some sect, uh, Nikayas, uh, introduced from Thailand. Then, uh, anyway, we have uh, chief Sanghas, leaders of monastics. Then, usually, uh, uh, according to tradition, uh, presidents and prime ministers, they uh, meet uh, these chief uh, Sanghas, Sanghas, member of Sanghas. Uh, for example, this is one of uh, them. This is one of them. Uh, in this, uh, here you can see uh, uh, several, several. Uh, uh, some of them are here. Not just one uh, Sangha uh, leader or Sangha, uh, chief Sangha, uh, but several, several. Then he makes uh, me wonder. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you, you, is it, uh, it was, was it clear for you? Yeah, but then it makes me wonder there are so many chiefs is that there is a system among the monks how to become the chief? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, you know, the, the first thing is the seniority, seniority. So, but uh, there, there are some more than uh, those like, you know, his education qualification, you know, in terms of the knowledge, uh, knowledge of the Dhamma uh, and uh, what we can, so education, uh, what I mean, uh, education, it's about uh, Dhamma education, Dhamma knowledge and traditional training, traditional, how he uh, or she uh, has got traditional training. Uh, they are important too, but the first uh, thing is it's about seniority. Uh, usually, uh, senior, uh, you know, when a monk get high ordination, high ordination, we we um, talk on this uh, yesterday. Uh, high ordination, higher uh, admission or perm uh, per sampada. So from that year, you know, if you are if you have. Uh, taken your high ordination 20 years uh, ago. So uh, you have to respect to the monks who have uh, taken 25 years uh, ago, the high ordination. You no, know, seniority consider based on high ordination. Seniority is considered based on high ordination. Uh, even you know what uh, in Buddhist dispensation, this is a unique uh, reason. It doesn't matter whether you are arahant, whether you have achieved the final goal, nibbana. If you are junior in terms of ordination, 
you have to respect seniors. Maybe the senior monks has not achieved Nibbana or Arahanship. It's about uh, society and survivals and socialization. It has to do with a lot. So uh, I'm going to repeat it. So for example, there is a monk who uh, has achieved uh, Nibbana or Arahanship, the highest spiritual goal. But he's a junior in terms of high ordination or admission. He has to respect the senior monks uh, who have not achieved spiritual goals. It's not about spiritual development. It's about uh, socialization and survival of the society. So then you can understand uh, how in Buddhism, you know, uh, the seniority is a, uh, uh, a big, a huge uh, thing in Buddhism. In this case, too, uh, Chief Sangamin, it's about sen uh, basically uh, seniority. Seniority. Yeah. You got it? So I guess if um, the goal is to get out of the samsara, then you really don't have <laughs> yeah, to care yeah. to be the chief or not. Yeah, why not? Why not? Actually, people people care about lot, you know, discrimination and you know hierarchy and chief. The, you know, in terms of worldly life, maybe uh, those are important. But if you want, uh, if you want to follow, if you, if you want really follow. Uh, want to achieve a spiritual goal, they have nothing to do with these, you know, hierarchy and these, uh, you know, post or whatever the things, useless. So they, uh, you know, it, it's different what the Buddha, uh, you know, uh, uh, introduced sometimes because uh, it's about uh, survival and uh, the society. But uh, if you are looking for spiritual development, spiritual goals, they have nothing to do with this uh, <laughs> hierarchy or seniority uh, or other qualifications, other qualifications. But uh, it's same uh, in everywhere in terms of Buddhist monastics, uh, Buddhist uh, dispensation. Bhante, I have one more yeah. question. Uh, okay, one of on. the slides you show that all, uh, uh, all the monks go for the arm foods. You know, mm -hmm. basically you have to eat whatever people give it to you. But what if mm -hmm. you have a food allergy or the food mm -hmm. allergies doesn't exist uh, among monks? Mm, not really, actually. Uh, uh, monks should have uh, to choose huh? you know usually uh, this is not an easy thing because uh, at the beginning uh, you know prince siddhartha prince siddhartha the bodhisattva he faces he faced the same situation because he was a, a royalty royalty he never big Uh, Buddha in his lay life. But after his ordain, after becoming an ascetic, he has to practice because he have to he has to collect foods. Oh, in his uh, on his first day, at the very beginning, it was not that easy uh, thing to eat because everything is there. You know? He was not comfortable with this uh, food because he was a royalty. He has uh, the things. So, but as time went on, what happened? He was familiar with 
this is what uh, uh, our life and monastic life, you know, our monastic situation. So whatever the Dayaka devotees offer, uh, they are ready to accept. But I think if I am talking frankly, you know, uh, they have, they should have choice, huh? choice. Sometimes people offer kinds of things. If, the, if something is allergic, they can, uh, you know, leave them or remove them and they can take whatever the things that uh, good for their body or health. That's the easiest <laughs> answer for your question. Lisa, you got, you got it? Yeah, but I saw their arm balls, uh, it's pretty big. So whatever yeah. they get uh, out of so many people, that's a long line of uh, people, oh. they're going to get a whole lot. Are they supposed to finish in one meal or are they supposed to store it for the next meal? Actually, uh, as I have uh, heard, you know, uh, he's not going to partake everything. So sometimes, you know, in, in monasteries, in temples, a uh, lot of people are there. Then uh, the vendables, they, they just collect food and then they uh, save some food for others. The people who are living in the monastery, uh, they are not going to partake uh, everything. Uh, they just collect. And uh, after taking uh, them to monasteries, them to monasteries, uh, then they have a choice. Then they have uh, options uh, to partake whatever the things they uh, want. But in general, so you have to be familiar with uh, this uh, system and practice as Bodhisattva did it. You know, Prince Siddhartha, Prince Siddhartha, oh, he, he had a lot of difficulties in terms of partaking foods. Oh, what, what, what was this, <laughs> what he said? So, but finally he was familiar with the system, but in this case, it's not that hard. That is what I uh, feel. So what I have heard, they, they just collect food. They are not going to partake on the roadside or, uh, you know, they go to monasteries and then they, uh, they can save uh, extra foods and they have a choice. Uh, they can select whatever, the, whatever they want. That is what I think, you know, you, you know I have, uh, uh, never experience, uh, you know, that kind of uh, uh, because, because a, a, as I already explained in Sri Lanka, we uh, get uh, foods, uh, you know, people bring foods to the temples. Uh, some monks uh, practice, especially monks who are living in the forest. Uh, they uh, they go arms round, they collect arms, but uh, majority. Uh, they're living in temples, monasteries, lay people cook uh, breakfast and lunch, and then uh, they uh, bring to the temple. That's the Sri Lankan tradition. Uh, but uh, in... Uh, Burma, Thailand, Cambodia, uh, Laos, in countries uh, like uh, Southeast Asian countries. This is the tradition. This is the tradition, uh, the uh, practice. Okay, thank you. Okay, you are welcome. So any other uh, concern or... So we are then we are uh, coming to next uh, part. It's about uh, uh, let's talk a bit about education. Education, uh, how uh, Buddhism influence. Uh, we talk about uh, we just finish about politics and uh, Buddhism.
education. So, uh, Buddhist education, uh, Buddhism uh, uh, has uh, impacted or influenced the education in uh, education system in each country. That is what uh, uh, we are going to talk next. Uh, because Buddhism has a uh, uh, long history. So in India, it started in India. Uh, usually uh, in uh, Buddhism, uh, uh, monastics have to monastics have, have to teach the Dhamma and Vinaya uh, to their uh, students or juniors or that is why in at present to in countries like uh, in in almost every countries we find monastic schools monastic schools and universities uh, all over the world uh, that's the buddhist tradition uh, always uh, uh, it's a part of uh, monastic life especially uh, in the afternoon in the afternoon in the morning time uh, they have some other things like uh, collecting foods and uh, religious uh, activities, but especially in the afternoon, what they did traditionally in India, even in other Buddhist countries, they uh, taught the Dhamma and Vinaya to their uh, pupils, seniors, seniors, teachers. That is how a, a Buddhist tradition survives in terms of Buddhist education. But what happened as time went on, Buddhist education uh, uh, well uh, developed in India. It was not limited to uh, only Buddhism. Uh, Buddhist institution uh, in India, a uh, lot of Buddhist institutions and universities had developed in the history. You know? And then they became uh, centers for education, not only for monastics, but uh, also lay community, lay community. Then as you see on these slides, secular arts, uh, literature, medicine, astrology, everything was there, it's university. Uh, As, as I know, as we know, uh, uh, the oldest uh, Buddhist, uh, the, the oldest university uh, in the world, you know, Bologna uh, in uh, Italy. So it uh, started in the, uh, uh, according to my, maybe uh, uh, according to my remembrance, uh, 10th century CE or something like that. But before that, according to history uh, historians, Buddhist, there were uh, many Buddhist universities in India, Buddhist universities. In the fifth century CE, in the fifth century CE, before 500 years ago, before Bologna, there were huge universities a lot of students, uh, actually they were international universities like that because from various Buddhist countries, students moved to India, travel to India in order to get uh, uh, Buddhist education. But as I already explained, uh, Buddhism was not the only subject, was not the only subject in those uh, universities. Uh, other uh, worldly subjects, secular subjects like astrology, uh, medicine, everything, a uh, lot of subjects uh, were taught there. Uh, so I'm going to uh, show you uh, guys, you know, uh, those kinds of Buddhist universities in India. Uh, you can see here. Uh, 
Nalanda is it's very famous in terms of Vajrayana Buddhism. Vajrayana Buddhism, Vaj, actually uh, Tibetan Buddhism, Vajrayana Buddhism, as you know, it uh, emerged in India, it developed in India, then uh, finally it established in Tibet. But uh, Nalanda University is the it was the center in which or where this tradition flourished, developed well. Because Mahayana uh, monks, teachers, they wrote a lot of uh, books uh, developing uh, Mahayana philosophy in universities uh, like uh, Nalanda, Nalanda University. So uh, I have a short video on, I found uh, on Nalanda University. So let's uh, watch, it's, a, it's going to be a short, uh, video Kore. Yeah, Kore. Right. yeah, I hear you. I, I'll send them. Okay. When the Buddha traveled to Nalanda, he often stayed in a mango grove. Nalanda was a prosperous and influential town during the Buddha's lifetime. It was here that Sariputra, one of Buddha's close disciples lived, attained enlightenment and preached. Many years later, Emperor Ashoka built a stupa for Sariputra. The Sariputra Stupa is one of the most imposing structures in the Nalanda site. It is located in the south end of the university complex. The original stupa has been worked upon and strengthened several times. Climbing the stairway to the top of the stupa, we see the Nalanda University complex. The university was built in the 5th century by the rulers of the Gupta dynasty. Facing east, we see nine monasteries, each provided with shrine chambers housing a large image of the Buddha. The construction was strong with well plastered walls and monastic cells. A nine storied building accommodated the library. Meticulous copies of books were kept covering all aspects of science, arts and philosophy. With eight separate compounds, ten temples, meditation halls and classrooms, the university was considered an architectural masterpiece. Nalanda was the world's first residential university. It accommodated 2,000 teachers and 10,000 students from Korea, Japan, China, Tibet, Indonesia, Persia and Turkey. Fazoli's five under five dollars. Five Fazoli's dishes you crave, like creamy, cheesy baked fettuccine Alfredo, or our new crispy saucy wings, all under five dollars. Served with our famous fresh breadsticks, only at Fazoli's. It's uh, about uh, Nalanda University. So if you are interested to uh, know more about this, you can find uh, uh, videos uh, on YouTube and uh, even there is a, a you know, 
uh, uh, there is a lot of information in the internet too. Uh, Nalanda, uh, that's the major, the main Buddhist university in India. And because uh, it's uh, what I wanted to uh, uh, emphasize, it was not limited to monastics. Uh, even though it was uh, based, uh, no, it, it, it was a Buddhist university, but uh, its education was not limited to uh, monastics it, for the whole society. That is why uh, its uh, uh, subjects, uh, curriculums, uh, everything was uh, 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 mm, a lot of subjects were there, a lot of subjects were there. Uh, it was a residential university, as you heard. And um, uh, what happened, uh, the unique things, it influenced uh, the Indian society on one hand. On the other hand, it influenced uh, the, the whole world, the whole Buddhist world. Because uh, the people who uh, taught their lecturers or professors who worked there, uh, they uh, did research uh, and uh, they wrote, uh, compiled a lot of Buddhist texts. That is what we find, you know, in the, uh, especially in terms of Mahayana. Most of these universities belong to Mahayana tradition. Uh, uh, just one or two belong to Theravada. So in these universities, uh, especially uh, professors, they uh, wrote, uh, compiled a lot of Buddhist texts. Uh, that, that is what we are using at present as primary sources, as primary sources in order to study Mahayana philosophy. That is what they develop, Mahayana philosophy like you know the concept of uh, sunyata emptiness even yogachara philosophy uh, and uh, vajrayana uh, everything was there and uh, they taught Takshila, uh, the other one, Takshila, Vikramashila, Valabi, Sompur, Jagadala, Odantapuri, uh, Pushpagiri. Uh, those are the other uh, Buddhist uh, universities. Those are the other Buddhist uh, universities uh, in India. I have put uh, some other... Uh, pictures uh, in terms of this university. You see here, uh, ruins of uh, the Nalanda, the University of Nalanda, Nalanda University. And then uh, the other one, uh, Sompur, Sompur. Chagadala, Chagadala. So uh, it's about India when it's uh, come to uh, Sri Lanka. When it's come to Sri Lanka, you see here a uh, person like uh, him, uh, you know. Uh, because of, uh, you know, uh, Sri Lanka has uh, a great history in terms of Buddhist education too, uh, monastic education in uh, for uh, 2,300 years. But uh, what happened, as I already explained in uh, 
1500 BC. Uh, not BC, 1500 CE, from uh, that era, uh, three uh, nations uh, uh, ruled Sri Lanka, invaded Sri Lanka, and it's called colonialism. Uh, first, uh, Portuguese, Portuguese, then uh, after that Dutch people, finally British, finally British. Sri Lanka, uh, and du du during that time actually, as we uh, already talked, uh, British dispensation almost uh, lost the lineage of uh, the Sangha. And even Buddhist education, uh also uh decline buddhism uh, buddhists suffer a lot during uh, this time but after that uh, uh uh you know during this time some people uh you know, indigenous people and some western people like him uh, henry still alcott he's an american he helped uh, in he uh, traveled to sri lanka and he helped in many ways in order to revive buddhist education here in sri lanka uh, buddhist uh, institutions monastic schools and uh, other buddhist schools uh, Re-established and uh, as a uh, as a result of their effort. So that is why, again, uh, uh, in the past, uh, I'm talking in terms of Sri Lanka. Uh, Sri Lanka had a, a uni Buddhist monastic universities like uh, in India, but later on they declined because of a lot of reason especially because of the foreign foreign invasions foreign invasion not only uh, dutch uh, portuguese dutch and uh, british but in the history indian people so south indian people invaded sri lanka they were hindu and uh, that is why they suffered then uh, anyway uh, at present uh, because of this revival uh, Buddhist education flourish in Sri Lanka. That is why we, uh, you know, we have the universities like uh, Kalania uh, because of this uh, revival. Uh, because, uh, it is based on monastic uh, tradition. Uh, this is what I, I, I wanted to uh, talk today in uh, many uh, aspects, many aspects, uh, select, some selected aspects, how uh, Buddhism uh, influence uh, the Asian people, some, uh, uh, so, I'm going to summarize what I uh, talked today. So th this is about uh, uh, three aspects, three aspects. Uh, Society, politics, and education. Society, politics, and education. Then, uh, what I wanted to uh, explain how uh, Buddhism, Buddhist concepts, fundamentals, had uh, or influence and continue to influence. 
uh, in terms of especially society politics and education in terms of society what i talk these kinds of uh, concepts loving uh, uh, charity self uh, sacrifice and these kinds of concepts how they uh, practice people how they influence that is what i uh, talk at uh, first then uh, I focus on uh, the Bodhisattva ideal and uh, then uh, especially uh, politics, politics. It's a big thing uh, that uh, influenced the Asian people, but, but we have to remember it's not that much uh, uh, in East Asian countries, uh, you know, in like uh, in China, uh, Japan, uh, in, in a country like uh, China, we do not see that much uh, uh, relationship uh, between uh, Buddhism and uh, politics. Uh, but as I, as I uh, discuss uh, in uh, uh, Japan uh, in the in the past, in the past, we see uh, uh, this influence, political uh, influence, what is influence on uh, politics. Then, uh, uh, especially in uh, India and other South uh, and Southeast Asian countries, uh, what we see, uh, we can see uh, clearly uh, political uh, influence. The relationship between uh, kingship or the politics and Buddhism. Because uh, always uh, uh, from the time of the Buddha, uh, Buddhism also needed uh, helps uh, from uh, from uh, kings, uh, royalties. Uh, In the history, what we see, uh, people uh, had, uh, Buddhism had got uh, this support image. That is how Buddhism survived. That is how Buddhism survived. It's about, uh, you know, uh, the, the government wanted uh, recognition to some extent. Then the Buddhism also, Buddhist dispensation, they, uh, they had to uh, survive. Uh, it's about, uh, on one hand, it's about mutual uh, relationship, mutual uh, uh, taking mutual, uh, you know, uh, taking benefits mutually. So uh, then this is what uh, I, uh, then uh, lastly, what I discuss, uh, it's about education, uh, some selected uh, aspect. So, uh, in terms of today's discussion, uh, uh, if you have, uh, it's time uh, for a discussion, if you have uh, anything, otherwise I'll uh, tell uh, in brief about the uh, uh, next uh, assignment uh, or topic a bit. I, I, I'm, uh, I'll try to explain a bit because uh, that will be great for you guys. Uh, when you uh, write next uh, assignment, the second uh, assignment. Uh, before that, I am happy uh, to have a discussion if you have any uh, question or concern in terms of uh, this uh, topic.
so uh, let me uh, show the class schedule. Uh, Because uh, today discussion has something to do with your second uh, assignment. That is why I uh, want to discuss a bit on this uh, because it, uh, it will be helpful uh, for you guys. So as you as you aware as you know, I believe that you have gone through this uh, schedule. Uh, due date is uh, May uh, thirty for the first uh, for the first uh, assignment. Uh, Then the uh, when we come uh, when it come to the second uh, paper, this is the topic. This is the topic. Buddhism and social works. Buddhism and uh, social work. That's the second topic. So uh, I think uh, you should have. Uh, uh, I'm, first of all, I'm going to explain a bit what you have to do, uh, what you have to write in this uh, assignment. Uh, then if you have, uh, if you need any more uh, clarification or explanation, uh, feel free to ask, uh, ask me. Uh, this is uh, about uh, uh, Buddhism and social work, uh, especially, uh, in this project, what you have to uh, do, you have to collect uh, facts and norms uh, from uh, Buddhist teachings in terms of uh, society and social welfare uh, and so on. Uh, in terms of Buddhist ethics, actually, uh, uh, what I want to emphasize two concepts in terms of fundamentals, two concepts are important. They are the, uh, uh, the concept of merits and demerits, what we call punya and papa, punya and papa, merits and demerits. And the other concept is kusala and akusala wholesome and unwholesome, wholesome and unwholesome. Uh, these are the fundamentals. These are the fundamentals uh, which uh, uh, the, this topic uh, uh, should be uh, based on these fundamentals. Then, as I have, as I have uh, explained uh, a, a bit uh, in my last uh, lectures, uh, these two concepts uh, has to do with Buddhist social works. Those are the fundamentals. Because uh, punya mean uh, positive energy, positive energy or good thoughts that we can generate in our mind by performing uh, some kinds of uh, religious activities. 
in many cases these religious activities are uh, helps uh, are conducive for others well being not only human beings uh, but in general for everyone in this earth or on this earth in this universe so as we discussed according to buddhism there are 10 kinds of uh, meritorious do deeds there are 10 kinds of meritorious deeds that a buddhist can practice by practicing those deeds uh, one can achieve generate positive energy positive thoughts uh, in his mind as we discuss a lot uh, throughout this uh, lecture series generosity is the first the uh, generosity whatever the things you can uh, uh, offer that is why bodhisattva and buddhist even in sri lanka in other countries they offer you know uh, 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 what's called uh, not only material things but uh, parts of the body maybe eyes Uh, maybe uh, kidney uh, and blood blood donation a uh, lot of things it's about the uh, survival of uh, everyone so uh, it's a part of uh, the bodhisattva ideal too but it's different uh, Uh, it's different uh, uh, it's different to some extent you know when it when it come to the bodhisattva ideal uh, especially uh, lay people the ordinary people they have to practice these uh, punya or uh, merits meritorious deeds bodhisattva practice kusala bodhisattva practice all some things then dana is the first then uh, when one uh, practice sila to sila at least someone can generate uh, uh, not generate at, at least someone can uh, radiate or practice loving kindness for a few minutes for a few minutes maybe uh, one time so two times for a few minutes according to buddhist tradition he or she generates lot of merits positive energy in his mind doing meditation doing meditation meditation practice also help in order to generate merits in one per, in person's mind then practicing seal practicing seal precepts help uh, in order to generate uh, merits in person's mind uh, and so on we find uh, kinds of meritorious deeds in buddhist texts in theravada texts as i already told you 10 meritorious deeds you can find it uh, easily in the internet uh, this uh, the second topics uh, is based on these uh, fundamentals 10 meritorious deeds and even uh, and on the other hand so people uh, when a person uh, practice kusala when a person practice kusala he also care in about society he also uh, he also uh, cares about society why am uh, why, uh, you know how uh, does it uh, happen because kusala means uh, you know uh, how uh, bodhisattva uh, the people who are on the path to nibbana especially they practice kusala they practice kusala all some things 
solve something. Then usually uh, the Bodhisattva practice, Kusala, ordinary people practice Punya. Bodhisattva, he uh, practice uh, giving up, while ordinary people practice giving. That's the difference. Anyway, in both cases, it, uh, it has something to do with society, caring about, uh, you know, caring, empathy, sympathy, and uh, those things. So, for example, being a teacher, being a teacher according to Buddhism, being a Dhamma teacher, or if you can uh, uh, give a Dhamma talk, if you can teach Dhamma, that's a meritorious deed as well. Because uh, by doing so, one can generate positive energy in his mind uh, because he's sowing the good things, which uh, ultimately at the end, it helps uh, for the survival of the society. Then uh, you can start, uh, actually, uh, you can find uh, fundamentals through these concepts. Remember uh, the concept of Punya Papa and Kusala Akusala uh, as uh, ethics, basic uh, Buddhist, Buddhist fundamentals. Then uh, try to uh, explain uh, their background. Every Buddhist practices all over the world based on these two concepts. Especially what I want to say, uh, the concept of Punya Papa are relevant to sansaric life, worldly life, mundane life. By performing, uh, by practicing punya, meritorious deeds, person achieve uh, positive energy and merits. Merits helps uh, in order to get favorable rebirth in the cycle of rebirth as, as, a, as an ordinary person. But uh, Kusala, when it's come to Kusala, it's different. When you practice kusala, it help. Uh, it's not about uh, sansaric life. It's not about uh, early life. It it help to develop your spirituality in terms of the final goal, the path. In terms of the final goal, that is why the bodhisattva, the person who uh, is seeking the Buddhahood. He always uh, tried to uh, practice Kusala. This is how these uh, two concepts uh, uh, are uh, different. You can you can uh, explain it to the, the basis of these two concepts, Punya Papa and Kusala Akusala, how they are uh, relevant uh, to Buddhist practices. And then, uh, based on these uh, two uh, concepts, how uh, you can uh, observe or notice some kinds of Buddhist activities, uh, which is uh, happen in all of, in especially in Asian countries, center in uh, uh, Asian countries, because uh, Buddhism has rooted uh, in Asia, in Asian countries, in uh, so. For example, uh, uh, I saw uh, in my lectures some pictures how people uh, try to uh, practice generosity. Generosity. It's about merits. It's about merits. And it's about uh, Kusala.
So uh, these kinds of things, this is how you have to uh, 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 make your uh, plan of your, this, of your second uh, assignment. Uh, and uh, when, you, uh, when you make uh, outlines, uh, if you can make outlines, uh, feel free to send it to me, then I can give my ideas too. So this is how uh, you, you have to uh, uh, focus on your second assignment. So uh, it's time uh, if you need more clarification in terms of uh, second, uh, the, the second paper or uh, in terms of today discussion both, it's time uh, You can uh, feel free to ask in, uh, any questions and clarifications. Um, Bante, for oh, the oh. Uh, religious activities, do you only want us to focus on the Asian countries? No, no, no. Uh, I, yeah, because uh, as I uh, emphasize, uh, Buddhism has rooted in Asia, uh, well established in Asia, but it doesn't mean that you cannot uh, talk uh, the other countries, especially Western Buddhism, Western uh, uh, Buddhist countries, you know, Buddhism in the West. So you can, uh, first of all, you can talk about fundamentals, uh, that it's necessary, you have to. Uh, what are the fundamentals which is based on Buddhist social works, Buddhism and social works? It's a, it's a famous subject at present, growing subject. Maybe you have heard about humanistic Buddhism, humanistic Buddhism. Uh, humanistic Buddhism has something to do with uh, this, this social work. Uh, this subject has uh, uh, developed in Mahayana uh, uh, traditions in countries like Taiwan, China, humanistic Buddhism. Uh, it's, uh, it, it's practiced in everywhere in, uh, in Buddhist and non-Buddhist countries. So first of all, uh, you have to uh, 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 write on the fundamentals. Then uh, when, you, when it uh, comes to examples, you can take uh, whatever the examples, for example, you know, maybe you have, uh, maybe you know about Suchi Foundation. Foundation, uh, a Taiwan, uh, one of great uh, nuns. What she is doing, it's amazing, eh? amazing, wonderful uh, uh, things. So uh, in many countries, she uh, do a lot of social welfare works. Uh, in the USA, UK, Thailand, oh, you can you can find it uh, in the internet. Uh, it's a great uh, things. It, it, that's called the bodhisattva ideal or merits or Buddhist social works. How when it come to practice, the people all over the world, Master Shinyun no uh, uh, Suchi foundations, uh, venerable. Uh, I I I just. Uh, uh, I just told examples. Uh, same thing happened in uh, in many, uh, you know, everywhere where Buddhists uh, lived, you know, because they wanted to they want to practice fundamental what the fundamental teachings uh, emphasize, you know. Then uh, you don't have to limit to Asian countries. The subject is. Buddhist cultural diversity in Asia. Maybe that is why you ask this question. Eh? Uh, but <laughs> we don't have to limit to, uh, in terms of assignments, we don't have to limit to Asia, Asian countries. Yeah. 
Hello, Bonte. I do have a quick question as well. Yeah, go on. So uh, I suppose it's all right to talk about multiple examples from different sources. So if we wanted to talk about Southeast Asia and then maybe East Asia and the West and give examples after listening to fundamentals, that's okay. But then conversely, if we wanted to just do a deep dive into one area, is that also all right? As long as we essentially talk about the fundamental aspects of Buddhism and how that applies to social work and then find an example. Does it matter if it's one source, but a deep dive, or if we select from a few different sources? Mm -hmm. Both of those yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, could you repeat it? Uh, you know, I, I did not get everything. <laughs> missing yeah, something sure yeah um my main question is since the topic is just buddhism and social work and it, it's just yeah. a, it's pretty broad i'm just yeah, making yeah. sure it's okay if yeah. the paper lists multiple examples from different countries or is it okay if the paper is only about one source but it's a deep dive into that one location are, are both okay as options uh i mean both okay try to uh, add uh, you know some selected examples you know uh, you don't have to worry uh, to, uh, that much so what you have to do first of all you have to uh, uh, explain the fundamentals you have to write on the fundamentals no arguments maybe early buddhism maybe uh, then you can add uh, the, how it develops theravada and then uh, mahayana and vajrayana too that is what usually we do when we say about Buddhist studies, Buddhism. We have to focus on the basically uh, on these uh, four aspects: three Buddhist tradition and early Buddhism. So, in terms of fundamentals, uh, for example, uh, 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 in early Buddhism. Uh, uh, we uh, do not find, you know, I'm answering to your question, we do not find 10 meritorious deeds in early Buddhism. We find these 10 meritorious deeds in Theravada Buddhism. Theravadins, Theravada tradition has developed 10 meritorious deeds. In early Buddhism, we just find three meritorious deeds, three meritorious deeds. What are those? Uh, generosity, uh, then uh, precepts, practicing precepts, and meditation. Dana, Sila, Bhavana. Dana, Sila, Bhavana. That's all we uh, find uh, in early uh, texts, in early Buddhism, in terms of meritorious deeds. But when it's come to uh, Theravada Buddhism. In Theravada Buddhism, what happened? Uh, these three uh, meritorious deeds have elaborate, uh, extend to 10, up to 10, up to 10 uh, meritorious uh, deeds. So this is how you can just uh, give a brief uh, overview on the fundamentals, a brief overview on the fundamentals fundamental that should be your first uh, uh, part then uh, you can uh, talk about examples of, you know just selected examples from different buddhist tradition you know from theravada mahayana and vajrayana at least one example or at uh, then uh, maybe three uh, uh, fundamentals like you know dana shila bhavana and uh, from three, uh, maybe uh, representing from three traditions. Uh, that's, uh, I think, uh, uh, then uh, that's enough uh, uh, because uh, then it, contain, uh, it contains fundamentals and practices both. Uh, and uh, in terms of Kusala, uh, I just told about meritorious deeds. Uh, you are, if I am pronouncing your name uh, correctly, Kel Ke Kelly? Uh, Kyle. Kyle, 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 sorry, sorry. Oh, no Kyle. problem. Yeah, uh, so in terms of ordinary people, we talk about 10 meritorious deeds, but in terms of Bodhisattva, we find Paramita. That, those are the fundamentals. 
in that case, uh, in Mahayana, we find six paramitas. Those are social works. Those are social works. Then in Theravada, Theravadin ha have, uh, has developed up to 10 paramitas, 10 paramitas. You can easily find them in the internet. Uh, then both are fundamentals of Buddhist social works. Uh, how Bodhisattva um, has dedicated his the whole life in order to uh, serve, uh, in order to uh, help uh, the people who needs, uh, uh, you know, his help. And uh, you want more uh, clarification? No, that's wonderful. Thank you, Bante. Yeah, yeah. You're welcome. Bante, then you say when you give the examples, you prefer us to give the example out of each tradition? Uh, yeah. Instead of uh, out of uh, some countries? Uh, yeah, you, uh, you can uh, give examples from... Uh, uh, in terms of Theravada from countries like Sri Lanka, Thailand, uh, and some other countries. Uh, in terms of uh, Mahayana, you can find a lot because they follow the Bodhisattva idea. Uh, 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 ten, uh, six perfection, as I uh, told you, in uh, China, Taiwan, Vietnam, in, uh, uh, in those countries, they follow uh, Kusala or Bodhisattva ideal. You can, uh, and from, from the USA or, you know, like Suchi Foundation. And then uh, in terms of Vajrayana, uh, you can uh, get examples from Vajrayana Buddhist countries in Nepal, Bhutan, Mongolia, Tibet, and so on. So, uh, Is it uh, clear for you? Yeah, for the Vajrayana, yeah. um, how many perfections do they have? How many? Yeah, like you say, Mahayana has a six, Theravada has a 10. Yeah, actually, uh, uh, as I explained, uh, there is not that much difference uh, between uh, Mahayana and Vajrayana traditions. Okay. They follow Mahayana uh, Paramita too. Uh, you know, uh, it's a later development of Mahayana uh, tradition. That is what is the scholarly view, uh, Vajrayana Buddhism. Uh, they follow Mahayana, in terms of fundamentals, uh, they follow Mahayana teaching, Mahayana traditions, uh, Mahayana Paramita perfection. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. So uh, if you don't have any more uh, question or if you don't need any more clarification, I think uh, uh, I'm going to finish uh, the class. Uh, uh, feel free to uh, uh, send uh, me uh, the outlines of your second paper, then I can give my comments, you know, uh, I. Uh, based on my time, you know, uh, I'm having a busy <laughs> life too. So when I have a, a free time, I uh, try to give you some comments uh, in brief to your uh, outlines, then uh, it will be uh, uh, good for your writings. Then you can start your writing. And uh, uh, right now, you can collect uh, information, data for your paper uh, through uh, the internet, uh, inter 
about merits and demerits, uh, wholesome and unwholesome, and examples, uh, Buddhist social works. You know, for examples, Lisa, you asked about uh, uh, examples from, you know, I, I can talk more about Sri Lankan examples. That, that's I know. Huh? That is why I am saying. So there is a uh, uh, the NGO, uh, non-governmental organization based on Buddhist uh, principle. It is called Sarvodaya. You can find in the internet, Sarvodaya. So I'll, I'll put it uh, in the checkbox, okay? I'll put... chat box. So I put it, uh, uh, the name of that uh, NGO, uh, non-governmental uh, organization. It's very famous uh, all over the world. Uh, it's based on Buddhist principles. It's based on uh, Buddhist principles, Sarvodaya, Sarvodaya in Sri Lanka. Uh, you got it? Sorrow there, yeah. That's just one example. You can uh, read more uh, in the internet on Saro there, Saro there. Then uh, you can take uh, from the Mahayana tradition, uh, maybe uh, su on uh, about Suchi Foundation or Poguan San or whatever you uh, prefer. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you can find examples. They are services uh, and how they how uh, they related to the Buddhist fundamentals. Uh, that is what we have to show in your uh, assignment. So, yeah. Uh, I'm not hearing from Lisa. I, I, I think you are talking something, but I'm not hearing. Oh, I'm fine. I think uh, yeah. um, it, it, the details you gave it to us, it's great. Yeah. yeah. Great. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, try to collect some information. Uh, then uh, uh, I think uh, that's enough for this week. Huh? That's enough for this week's. Uh, uh, we had lectures for how many hours? For uh, eight hours, I think. It's, yeah. So uh, we have to take a rest. Eh? We all have to take a rest. So uh, feel free to uh, email me if you have uh, if you have any questions. Uh, depending on my time, I'll uh, reply to you. And then see you next time, uh, Corey. You you there? Corey. Yeah, Corey. Yeah. Yes. Corey. Corey is the man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
So, yeah, uh, that that topic also uh, good too. I I am I'm I see here another uh, topic. So then, uh, have a good day. Huh? Right. Have thank a good you. day. Uh, I'm going to leave. Huh? All right, see you, you next much. week. See you next week. Thank you, Pante. You're welcome.